organizational culture change. Uh, I would like to welcome you to episode two of the OSS Organizational Organization No Sustainability series from Singapore. The series consists of three one-hour episodes with where respected thought leaders from Singapore discuss the latest trends in organizational sustainability. The series is brought to you by Cognitive Talent Solutions, DCH and HR Tech Hub. And on behalf of everybody, welcome to our webinar. So today's episode is titled Accelerating Organizational Culture Change. This episode will be structured as a fireside chat, providing you, our dear audience, with the unique perspectives of all speakers in the event. Our speakers today are Francisco Marin, co-founder and CEO of Cognitive Talent Solutions, Alvin Goh, Executive Director at SHRI, otherwise known as the Singapore Human Resources Institute, and Jacqueline Lee, CHRO at SUTD, the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Please join me in a warm virtual round of applause to everyone. So for the next 30 minutes, we will discuss two questions with the panel, and then we will have some time for the audience to ask questions to the members of the panel. Please do type your questions in the chat at any time, and we will put them forward to the panelists during the Q&A. So the first question for our panel is the following. How do you accelerate change adoption within an organization? Um, maybe I'll start with Alvin. Alvin, how are you today? Hi, Natasha. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us uh, to this panel. So everything's good. So, uh, yeah, you know, uh, on that note itself, you know, I, I, you know, in the past itself, we always think about culture as a destination, right? And uh, one thing for sure in terms of COVID itself, you know, uh, where everything seems to be in a flux, you know, and I've been thinking about a culture destination or a culture journey of change. So my, my thinking in terms of how do we really accelerate change adoption within an organization is that I think first and foremost, uh, we need to understand, is it a destination that we want to head towards or, or in other words, find a landing or is it a continuous over the next two to three years, a continuous journey itself that we want to move towards? All right. And I think number one for me is about, you know, when we talk about culture change and transformation and uh, agenda in today's context, I think the first key thing that we need to understand is that and take into consideration is the overall maturity of an organization in terms of the processes, the procedures, uh, the people's ability to, to change and transform. And also more importantly, what are the platforms that are enabling us to change today? I think technology is something that uh, has really somewhat accelerated uh, this change that we are seeing today. Even right now, you know, in the past, in the post, in the pre-COVID world itself, a lot of these sessions were done either face to face, you know, or and today itself, you know, Zoom, uh, Teams, and everything is so common these days, right? And that's why we have all this Zoom fatigue itself. And I think number one in terms of being able, also there are, there are aspects in terms of being able to accelerate change itself. It's really we need to really build the business case for all these changes and transformation. All right. What are the data points that we are looking at? What are the evidence uh, pointing towards that we need this change itself? And I think we also really need to communicate the urgency itself right, for all these changes to take place. Uh, you know, culture change to me, uh, in the past itself, it was always a very uh, sensitive, very dicey uh, project to undertake, even as a, a, a subject matter expert and also as a senior consultant, we are a very global consulting firm. And whenever a client always want to talk about culture change, we were always, always very careful on that. And one of the key areas I realized and understand is that why culture change fail is because many a times business leaders or project managers, or even to a large extent consultants, or we set too many assumptions. And when these assumptions fail to materialize, the whole entire project goes off, right? And we miss the mark all in all and totally. So I think part of the mitigation factors in terms of how to also accelerate change is that we need to identify assumptions, but also as well, the mitigations itself that must be set in place 
what of the assumptions must materialize to help us get to that destination, right? I think these are the key few areas that, you know, will really accelerate change adoption within an organization. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And Jacqueline, how are you today? What's your take on this? Accelerating change. Okay. It's an interesting topic and it's a topic of my passion because I've uh, been working in the area of culture. And also uh, last year, uh, interestingly, uh, published a book called Accelerating Organization Culture Change. So if you think about uh, what's happening with today's uh, Industry 4.0, digital transformation, and with the rapid changes brought on by the pandemic, uh, you know, in fact, acceleration has gone up by three to four times. So in fact, a lot of leaders I've met uh, have shared with me that it is actually easier to move the needle on technology than to move people, okay? Uh, in fact, uh, for these organizations that have been very successful with digital transformation, uh, those that have been successful and were able to accelerate a lot faster in terms of transformation, those were the ones that were actually very successful uh, with culture transformation. So that means getting the culture right, it's important, it's an important prerequisite to uh, you know, even digital, before digital transformation. So um, in culture change, um, I've done quite a lot of projects in culture transformation. So when I was the senior vice president of, in a very large security company uh, in Singapore is the largest, we were trying to actually uh, transform the organization for about 10,000 employees at that time. So I remember during those days, uh, we had to spend uh, time speaking to groups of people like in you know, 100 at a time to talk to them, tell them why it's important to change, get them to you know, buy into the change. And, and it took me like two years to do that transformation project, which was a success, but it was too long. So it then began my interest to look at digital tools. I said, if we can accelerate that kind of transformation at a much faster speed, then we were doing that could really help organizations because of the rate of changes move along so fast, especially in the last couple of years. So I began to uh, work uh, in, on a topic of digital tools. So I began to, uh, when I joined the Singapore University of Technology and Design, I began to you know, start to research into this area and realized that if we could use those digital tools to do those conversations, that means instead of having conversations with groups of 100 people, could I put them all into a decision room all at one time and get everyone to contribute ideas at the same time? So we began to experiment with this kind of digital tools. And uh, we found out that after about a year or two years of research, I found out that we could actually a speed up change uh, by in fact three times the speed using digital tools for, for culture transformation. So we began to explore these tools and we were, were very successful in really doing this kind of transformation at a much faster speed. So in accelerating organization culture change in two days climate, uh, to me it's not just the ch change management but using the right time of digital tools and methodology to be able to change culture at a much faster speed because we really can't afford to take two years to get everyone along the journey uh, because of the rapid rate of change and with climate change, with sustainability being big social issues. Um, so I believe you know, uh, that uh, the methods have changed and that include using uh, the latest technology in transformation. And just one more thing to share and I have done a bit of study in my book and realized that uh, the companies like Microsoft, Netflix, Google, they are examples of companies that have been very successful with radical changes uh, because uh, they were able to change very fast and anticipate and create customer demands. So Netflix created the demand. You know, they, they came up with revolutionary concept to create demand. So they also created a very collaborative and very entrepreneurial culture to harness new ideas and creativity. So in moving organization culture in today's world, digital tools are a great way to facilitate change as well as bringing communities together to be able to bring ideas together. Uh, I call this collective teams uh, to, to move the needle at a much faster speed. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jacqueline. And hey, Francisco, how are you? It's 1 a.m. where you are. Hi, Natasha. Um, let's 
your take, um, what do you see across organizations and successful ways that companies are accelerating change? Yeah, so uh, I think that uh, Alvin has brought a very important point uh, regarding the need to consider uh, change management and culture change management as a uh, capability because it's something that is happening on a regular basis and I also agree with Jacqueline's point of the vital role that um, tools play in helping us accelerate uh, culture change adoption right so maybe I would like to complement their points uh, by emphasizing on the importance of considering social capital as well so uh, I think that because any change initiative uh, and by extension any culture change initiative is a people management initiative at the core and any people management initiative is about managing both the human capital and, and the, the human and social uh, capital components of it right only by complementing existing human capital metrics and with social capital ones we can effectively accelerate uh, change adoption so when it comes to accelerating uh, change adoption whether we are talking about accelerating a, a culture or implementing a new technology or new ways of working I think it is always uh, critical to understand who are the informal leaders and in, or top influencers within the organization. Um, and these, infor these informal leaders may or may not have a formal leadership role. Um, so we need to identify these informal leaders and make sure that they are using their influence to accelerate change adoption instead of using it to create resistance against the change adoption we are, we are trying to, to push. Actually, recent research shows that only 3% of informal leaders um, can influence up to 85% of the remaining population in an organization. I mean, as much as we think we know our own organization, it is only by conducting an organizational network analysis or other people analytics uh, tools that we can properly understand who are these informal leaders within the organization uh, and manage their influence in a proactive way instead of doing it in a reactive way. Um, so if we're implementing a cultural change, for example, these informal leaders are the people we want to position as cultural ambassadors. If we are talking about an implementation of agile uh, methodologies, these are the people that we want to use as agile champions. If we are talking about the technology change, these are the people that we want to use, for example, as ERP super users, right? So independently of the, of the type of change we're implementing, but especially in cultural changes, uh, because they are so relevant nowadays, right? I want to emphasize the importance of identifying the, the informal leaders and managing the social capital component of that change. Thanks for that, Francisco. Well, for us at People, we've, we noticed that uh, organizations who have been much more successful at accelerating change have three very basic building blocks. One, communication, right? Channels need to be open and messages need to be clear, simple, and well communicated. Some companies have also found success in leveraging on technology by implementing gamification. So using fun and games to encourage understanding, participation and support. And secondly, leadership. Leadership, the usual, right? This is oldie and goodie, but it never stands, uh, it never fails. Leadership needs to be seen to physically support and reinforce the messages. That means to walk the talk and be aligned amongst themselves. And lastly, involvement make employees part of the process and involve them right from the start and be transparent, authentic, and empathetic. So let's move to the next question. How do you envision ch culture change and how do you think it will evolve in the future? Jacqueline, can we have your views? Well, I think I, I spoke, uh, uh, you know, of course about digital tools but the future is also about building a very boundaryless culture where teaming is actually the new way of working. Uh, you know, really the ability to share resources widely to achieve the same results and foster a culture of, uh, you know, sharing not just ideas, but your products, your methods and best practices uh, to really build a thriving community of problem solvers. So you can again see this kind of collective teamwork in Google and Netflix where they, have, uh, they bring teams together because problem solving and agile is the new way of work. So in, in the future culture, you know, really we'll have to look at areas such as impact, footprint, the speed to market, uh, the open communications as well as, uh, you know, empowerment and autonomy. So I see future culture as something uh, that it's akin to one of a growth mindset. So I love this book by Satya Nadella, uh, read it many, many times. Uh, it talks about the amazing story of how he actually transformed Microsoft from a very 
political, you know, uh, you know, environment where people were not cooperative. Uh, people were just, uh, you know, uh, trying to stab each other at the back into to a culture that fosters teamwork, to a culture that is of what we call a growth mindset. So what Satya, uh, you know, Satya says, a growth mindset is something that helps you to better anticipate and react to uncertainties. And organizations are actually able to learn uh, to lean onto uncertainty, uh, to take risks, to move very quickly when mistakes are made and to recognize failure happens along the way. So a growth mindset is one that shifts externally to not just look at internal, but externally to how we can look at a highly competitive landscape, partner with friends and former enemies are actually needed. So you need to form alliances and partnerships. Uh, you know, in our organization, in our university, we, we, we can't survive on an island. So we have a lot of international partnerships with other, uh, you know, global uh, universities, global organizations, with industries. So it's basically an entire ecosystem where you actually spread your intellectual capital, you bring in capabilities and talent beyond your shores, you know, to be able to harness that kind of um, a culture of collaboration and idea sharing, I think that's where you really can grow. So I see culture to be something like this. Uh, it's evolving. Uh, future culture is going to be something that's very collaborative and uh, spreads beyond your shores. And, and it is a continuing journey. Uh, it's unfolding, you know, it changes. I think just as what uh, I've been saying, it's not the destination, it's a journey. Uh, uh, you know, especially at the speed of technological disruptions that's happening, uh, it's a constant, we constantly uh, unlearn, learn as well as we learn you know, in, in this culture journey. Thank you. Thank you. Alvin, what are you? you know, yeah, so I, 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 you know, I, I'm going to say, put across this statement here on this platform. And I, I, there's a very high possibility that I'm going to kick myself you know, two years, three years down the road by offsourcing this. But my take in terms of how I see culture change management will evolve in the future is this, right? And contradicting to what you said earlier on, Natasha, that leaders drive culture change. I got a very strong feeling that it's going to be a myth in the future whereby leaders don't change the culture by through their behaviors. Leaders will facilitate that change. And, and this is what I'm seeing, all right, from, from, from this environment. Number one, as, as what Jacqueline said about data and, and technology, I fully agree with her, you know, so much data and tech is going to be something that we will really, really drive. And, and as we move to, towards a data-driven organization, I think business leaders will rely more on data, all right, to really act on those um, uh, key points and come up with decisions. So that's one key area. The second key area is, of course, with the great resignation, you know, no doubt burnout is really, really real. But, you know, we, we, we hear at SHI itself, we, over the course of, of this year itself, we have also engaged uh, several groups of um, people here in Singapore as well, you know, and uh, average age, you know, 35 to 39 years old. And I asked this question, where do you see, are you still seeing yourself in this, in your current uh, organization in the next year or next three years? And most of them, almost 80% said no, they are not going to stay with the organization. And I thought that they were coming from a perspective of being burnt out, right? But strangely to my surprise, they said that they, they were looking for an organization and a lot of them wanted to join a startup environment. And I asked this question, why a startup environment? They said that because in a startup environment, they are given an opportunity to shape the organization culture as well, all right? And perhaps maybe that's why, you know, if I really look hard at it, uh, why the civil service here in Singapore is somewhat losing some of their people uh, to, to, other, uh, to other platforms and like startups and everything. I think, you know, if we work in a very well-established, well-organization you know, itself, the opportunity to shape culture is not going to be there as compared to maybe in a startup environment. So that's, that's the second key point. And the third key point, of what I'm seeing is, is this. Companies like Tencent, DD, JD.com, and Supercells, all right, they have a very, very flat organization, all right, number one. Number two itself, uh, they are what 
what we call uh, market-orientated organizations or network organizations, where each of these cells all right, in, in Tencent DD, they operate in silos away from uh, the senior management team and they shape the, and they, they react in a very agile manner uh, and adjust their products and services uh, to what the cost the, the consumers wants almost very immediately without interference from you know a chief technology officer or the CFO or whatsoever and this is how this market oriented organizations uh, are reacting so if I think about this question if if leaders are the ones are they really going to be the ones going to set the pace for culture change or are they just going to facilitate culture change? So that's, that's, the, that's the thinking that I have. And I, these are the three key areas from data and tech, from, you know, from, from the being an market organization, and, and this is what I'm seeing uh, possibly. So that's, that's my view. Yeah. Thank you. I love those very provocative ideas. Francisco, from what's your take? Yeah, I, 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 I would like to, to follow up on the, on the thoughts shared by Alvin. Uh, in my case, I had the opportunity to, to work for five years at, at a Fortune 500 company at IBM and then another four years at a, at a startup in Silicon Valley. So I have a good overview of both, of both worlds. And I, I fully agree with Alvin. Um, you know, I think that uh, in, in order to anticipate where culture change management is going to go, we have to understand also where we are coming from. Right uh, in the 80s, the, the 90s, uh, one of the most revolutionary concepts that was introduced with Lean and with Kaizen um, was the concept of Gemba. Basically, the, the it was encouraging to con involve people at all levels in the organization in the process of transforming um, the, the the company. In that context, it was really because they were coming from a manufacturing context. Uh, context right, so only the people that were working in the warehouses were the ones that really knew the process. And if you just ignore them uh, when it comes to transforming the organization, you didn't achieve a, a good result. Then uh, agile uh, methodologies uh, led, later on uh, follow up on this because they nurture themselves from Lean as well, but they are, we're looking at it more from a software perspective, right? Promoting the creation of autonomous squads that can operate without being so constrained by bureaucracy and with a, not that much with a top-down approach, but more with a bottoms-up approach, right? Um, in I think right now we are in a in a situation where COVID has disrupted completely uh, the way organizations work. Companies are being kind of like forced to go into a hybrid work model, um, and in this context. Uh, what we are doing basically is to continue that trend of decentralization that we have seen over the last years uh, that was previous, was already in place previous to, to, to COVID, right? So if this trend of decentralization continues, definitely, as Alvin was saying, uh, companies will want to look more like startups. Why? Because startups, uh, because the team is so small, you can work with whom you want or what you want. But as the company scales, that's not possible anymore. And the moment that you start creating hierarchy, in the moment that you start creating um, uh, different teams, uh, that organization tends to create organizational silos. And it's not something that was originally uh, developed, like the structure of big multinationals to uh, face the level of change and uncertainty that they are doing nowadays, right? So um, again, I think that in the future, Technology is going to be very important. Understanding the internal collaboration dynamics in tools like Office 365, uh, Jira, GitHub, who are the informal leaders, managing social capital and human capital together. Those are going to be very relevant areas. And also kind of like more from a longer term perspective, start preparing ourselves for, to, for the transition towards uh, decentralized autonomous organizations in blockchain, and other alternative methods that will appear down the road. But that definitely that interaction between startups and multinational is going to be critical. Okay, right. Before we start to invite questions from the audience, um, I'd like to just cap off this interesting discussion by saying um, we believe that culture change of the future is all about change, right? And it's about embracing it, navigating it, managing it, living it. That thing that never changes is change. The office model, as you say, has evolved the way we communicate working across time zones, the way we engage and motivate, using a lot of technology, and of course, also accommodating the different uh, generational differences and what they need. 
So uh, at the end of the day, we're looking at a many size fits all approach. And we have to, like uh, what Jacqueline was saying, keep trying, keep failing fast, uh, test fast, fail fast, be prepared to pivot. And um, I think also most importantly, keep a humanistic approach and have fun whilst we're at it. Okay, we're gonna bring some questions in from the audience. And um, there's a question here for the panelists. How do you deal with employees who are resisting change because their habits are threatened? Maybe I can take a step at it. Um, I've dealt with a lot of resistant employees <laughs> in, my, in my career. And uh, I, I think it's not a simple <laughs> solution because everyone have comes from different backgrounds, different beliefs, different, you know, different kind of uh, you know, education. You know, so, so, I mean, to expect people to come into an organization, expect everyone to immediately subscribe to what you're trying to do, it's not an easy task. So I think the, the question here is that uh, what I typically do, you know, is to basically, you know, uh, do it from a very bottom up approach. You cannot drive culture just by forcing it down from the top. So I do a very ground sub approach where I get go down to the ground and get everyone to contribute ideas on what they think is the ideal culture. You know, we get them into the vision and you know strategy and what do you think is the ideal culture and get everyone to participate, have a voice to what things the future culture. And then we ask them, you know, what do you think where we are right now and where do you think are the gaps? And that's why the digital tools come in is where we open up our digital platform to allow everyone an equal voice to share their thoughts on how they think change should happen. And then you get the ideas. And one of the things I realized with very resistant employees, I always make them champions. They either become my change champions or I get them to champion a project that they believe in. And then you find that many times the resistance goes away. But I have to warn that there will be a group of hardcore people who refuse to change. So my philosophy is that I will give you time to change, but if you do not want to change, uh, the, the ship has, has to sail. And you know, if you want to be left behind, I can't help you. So we will give opportunities, but you know, we will move along if uh, hardcore ones refuse to change. So um, I just thought a bit of that sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any, any more comments on this or shall we bring another question? Yeah, I'd just like to, to, to add on, I think Dr. Jackie really hit home the whole entire message, All right? Um, and I think to be very real about it, you know, there will be always be hardcore resistor, uh, resistors, right, on, on that front itself. And as what Dr. Jackie said, the ship must sail forward itself. Um, and I suppose that what I'm trying to say is that as leaders ourselves, there's only so much we can do so don't take it too hard on yourself, whereby uh, when people don't want to change and you have to really let them go, all right? Uh, and I've seen many CHROs and business leaders themselves uh, try too hard, too much too often just to get this uh, small little group of people, this hard resistors uh, to try to change and they take it upon themselves. And I think it's it's... To some extent, it's energy wasted, but I think we also need to have the, the moral courage and to just sail forward, all right, uh, on this note itself. Like, uh, I mean, I've come, to, I've come, to, I've, I, I recently more, one of, I'm raising this up because one of the recently, one CHR was asking me, in his company, there's almost close to about slightly less than 10% of his workforce who doesn't want to get vaccinated in Singapore, all right? And, uh, she was kicking herself because she was very empathetic to them. And come 1st January here in Singapore, we know that under the VOD regime, the vaccine or regular testing regime, we are allowed to redeploy them or even to some extent, you know, um, terminate their, their employment contracts. And she's kicking herself so badly on this front, trying to just to get them to go for vaccination and so forth. So my message here is really, you know, to, to let everyone know, it's like, let's not, kick ourselves too hard, right? And, and we, we need to sail the boat, we need to sail. So thanks for that. Yeah, I, I, I want to, to, to quickly uh, complement the, the two answers. Uh, I, I, I agree with that 
COVID is providing a, a great example on change management, right? Like, because we, we are all part of, of this big change that is uh, pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone and changing our habits, right? So uh, if we uh, make a comparison between the COVID as a change and the change that happens in the organizations, right? Uh, the government communication would be the equivalent to the formal communication from leaders that come in their uh, um, or, or organizations, right? Uh, we will need to consider as well, for example, the role of the informal leaders who would be uh, maybe influencers or famous people that we look up to. And you know, it might be uh, famous from any background. It's really important as well to have uh, the influence of those people aligned with our objectives and not creating resistance against it, right? Uh, and then ultimately as well, the people that are in our immediate environment right? Uh, independently of what the uh, people that we admire or the formal communication is, uh, the behavior of the people that we interact with on a daily basis, our friends, uh, our, our co-workers, that's also going to impact our uh, ability to accept that change and, and to create resistance or not. In my experience, sometimes the people that create the most resistance are also the ones that can contribute the most. I often had a situation managing uh, Lindsay Sigma projects, for example, where the people that create the most resistance were the most experts in a certain process because they are the, the ones that um, feel attacked the most or they feel disrupted the most, right? So uh, I think definitely I agree with this, something that should be expected, something that you will have to deal with. You will not be able to convince all of them. Um, but one of the best ways that you can deal with that again by combining human capital with social capital approaches look up at it in a more holistic manner than we are doing right now thank you yeah so we have a comment from uh, richard brady hi richard um and he's saying to build on alvin's point with regards to great resignation with work becoming hybrid and work from home how desirable to colleagues or realistic will it be to accelerate culture change? People's workplace and colleagues are increasingly their family and home. Well, I, I think on that note itself, you know, if we really think about it, the fact that we are even working from home and, and uh, that's what Dr. Jacqueline was saying about, you know, using technology platforms and, and teams as well, we are already on a journey of change itself already. Uh, despite you, you know, if, even if we move into a full hybrid workforce, uh, you know, even if we bring in uh, geek workers into the workforce that you know, we have to work with and deal with, um, technology itself as a platform has already facilitated um, that process over the last two years or 21, 22 months. And human beings are habits of creatures, right? Or creatures of habits. Uh, and, and to a large extent, you know, I, I don't really see a problem going forward uh, itself on that front. Uh, regardless if we are back in the office, if we are working from home, or we are doing remote work, you know, sitting in a cafe uh, <laughs> and having a team meeting, <laughs> I think all this itself, bless you. I think all this itself are, uh, are really part of it. I think, you know, and, and, I, I, and I seriously don't think it's going to be a major issue uh, on that front. Uh, colleagues are family members to some extent, you know, if you want to think about that way, because we are constantly in touch with one another. And, and here in Singapore, we spend what, eight hours, nine hours, or even more, you know, on that front with, with our, with in, the, in the workspaces and today itself, you know, uh, we, we are doing a lot of, of, we are putting in a lot of hours uh, and it's not easy. And, and I think, you know, over this period, I, I, I really seen the, the good side or uh, the human, the humanizing side of my colleagues, whereby, you know, recently, like one of our colleagues even had uh, uh, COVID itself and, the whole entire office really showed a lot of empathy and they really stood up and they said, hey, don't worry. Why don't you just recover? Take your time. Let me cover your duties for you. And all this are, are really coming out in the workplace. I'm not sure about any other, or, uh, other organizations, but at SHI, and this is what I saw, you know, really teams 
uh, stepping up to help out one another, right? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I see that happening a lot more as well. And that blurring between work and family is, is positive. You know, people get to know each other better. Um, similarly, in I, our yeah. Place. Yeah. I, I just want to add in a, another point. Uh, I think uh, definitely the pandemic has accelerated change. Uh, we're forced to change because of the pandemic. But I think what is important is, uh, you know, for us to relook at our leadership models, uh, relook at the way we manage our employees. Uh, we no longer need to micromanage, but trust, empowerment, and as well as uh, change the way we do teaming and bonding. For example, I have switched. I, I can't see my team, right? So I do, I, I have a weekly, we call a check-in. And we do nothing but play games. It's nothing serious. No work is discussed. We just do silly things together once a week. And, you know, they, you know the, the, the staff, the team just loves it, you know. So we do a lot of, we are kind of try to be creative and think out of the box. Uh, to 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 build teams around digital platforms, you know, do team around platforms. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, we have a question from Tony. Hi, Tony, and thanks for this. I've incorporated new values and attitudes to weave into our culture. How do I embed this to the employees? I can try to answer. So basically, when you say if, if this question is, uh, okay, I'm just trying to read it. So you've incorporated new values and attitudes to weave into our culture. In the first place, when new values and attitudes are weaved into the culture, is this something that is top down? Uh, is it something that I produce a document? I just decide that I, I, I'm going to write down the values and I'm going to tell my employees, look, this is the new values. So the way I look at values is you must have, a, it must be democratic. You need to talk, you need to engage, you need to go down to the ground, you need to have, a, you know, a world cafe sessions to get ideas from your, your team about what kind of values, what kind of culture they would like to see and what kind of attitudes and <laughs> let them be the ones driving that. Because, you know, if it comes from them and if you, when you implement it, you're going to have a lot more buy-in. So I suggest that if you have written something, don't, don't go to employees and say, look, this is the new culture, you know, take it. But it's just, you know, just do a consultation, you know, throw out the ideas and get them, get, get feedback, you know. You're going to get much better, you know, uh, buy-in you know, to those ideas. Thank you. Yeah, I, was, I, I wanted to add as well that uh, in order for people to, to really buy into values and, and mission statements and culture, right, they need to be genuine sometimes i have the have the sensation that many companies are adopting a mission statement and values and and even culture as such just because it's something that is relevant or it's like a buzzword or something that is trendy at the moment right but it doesn't feel as genuine as when you see some for example like a startup that is born with a certain purpose and uh, all the people are aligning into it right it's something just that companies need to have by, by default. And I think that employees instinctively feel that, right? Uh, some of the uh, values feel sometimes a bit genetic or, or they are very similar to what you can find in other companies. Sometimes they're borrowed from other companies uh, right away, right? But um, again, if <laughs> and, and understanding where this is coming from, uh, if we look at some of the first companies that really adopted uh, culture as a critical part of their operations, like Google, for example, right? When they started to put ping pong tables around and so the software developers could work full-time instead of uh, working per hour. Uh, I think it, it's very difficult to uh, adopt at organization level if it's not something that you have done it from the beginning at the foundation of the organization. Right, so it, it's really important. And I, maybe the, the answer would be to bring people that have gone through that experience of starting an organization with a certain value and mission statement so they can convey that. Because if you have not experienced it from the experience of starting a, a company from the uh, beginning, it's really difficult to apply it in an organization with uh, hundreds of thousands of employees when they have been operating for 30, for 40 years in a completely di different way. That's my take on it. Uh, look at it more from, from a startup perspective. 
I would add to that and say that um, you know values and attitudes and culture, they they are the how you do things and why you do things. And um, one great way that I've seen organizations do it is um, get get others to to live it. And when the behaviors are shown, call it out. You know, call it out and 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 thank people for 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 doing that. And after a while, uh, that be becomes part and parcel of what you do, you know, and that becomes a unifying factor for everyone. Yeah. Okay. I think we might have time for one or two more questions. How do you deal with resistors because of a fear, fear of failure? You know, recently itself, right? Um, we wanted to embark on a RPA, remote robotics processing on automation project itself. And um, what we did, as, as what Dr. Jacqueline said, right, it's all about visioning. It's all about sh showing uh, the way forward. Because let's face it, it, people has got a natural tendency to fear the unknown, right? Uh, and the moment you are able to project and show them the way and prove to them that it can be done and facilitate that learning itself and not to force feed, you know, uh, people, resistors tend to, right, neutral people and uh, neutral neutralities and, 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 and then somewhat, you know, not too negative people would actually tend to overcome that fear of failure. That's number one. Number two, of course, you know, as, the, as I said, many leaders themselves, we cannot be um, discipline masters and task masters, right? Whereby if there's failure, then that's what Dr. Jain said, let's learn, relearn, unlearn, right? And move forward from your failure itself. And I think in the Asian mentality, that's where, you know, there's this fear um, concept here, right? Whereby... If you don't do well, the bosses are going to score you. You don't do well in school, your parents are going to score you, right? Uh, and so forth and so forth. I think we really need to move away from this fear of failure. All right? I think the biggest failure is that it's, it's just not trying out itself. And, and I think that's going to be detrimental to not only for us, but also for, for organizations themselves. And one more, how do I identify change champions who can advocate the change? I can see Francisco smiling. <laughs> yeah, just, just wanted to add one also on the, on the previous one um, in, before answering this one, right? But on the, on the fear of failure, I think this is a critical uh, uh, topic, right? I, I, having lived in and work in Singapore and also in Silicon Valley, I think that one of the main things that all the regions in the world can learn from Silicon Valley is the attitude towards change, right? One of the models here is uh, move fast, break things. And uh, the, the concept there is that you have to see failure as a necessary part of iteration, right? So you want to fail as quickly as possible, as early as possible, and learn from that failure, right? But you should not avoid failure because that's something that is going to happen as soon as, as far as you're growing. And Definitely many of the problems that large organizations have nowadays is because of the fear that people have of reporting that something bad has happened to their immediate supervisor and that, that we end up with the problems that we have as a society as well, right? Because in the end, like, the, this not only affects the private sector, but affects all the, all the sectors in many situations. Um, how, how can you identify the champions? A very good way is uh, conduct an organizational network analysis, run a survey, ask employees uh, who they are going to when they need uh, to share information, when they need personal support, technical support, inspiration, and identify those informal leaders that we're talking about in the organization, right? And those informal leaders are the people you want to position as uh, agile champions, as, as chain champions. Because if the people that you position are just people that have formal leadership, but they don't have the respect of the organization, it doesn't matter how hard they try, uh, they will not be able to move the needle and accelerate change adoption. And the, the real informal leaders might use their influence to create resistance against those changes. Right, okay. 
Well, um, we did promise that we will end on time today. So it's uh, seven minutes to the hour. And I wanted to firstly thank everyone uh, for being here. Dr. Jacqueline, Alvin, Francisco, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it.